Thank you guys so much. It's such, you know, it's really exciting to see such a great crowd here tonight. Um, we uh, were very excited to have our friend Marcus Green moderate this panel, but he had a, a personal emergency um, today, and so I'm going to be stepping in for him, uh, which means I will also kind of sort of be a panelist as well. Um, so please bear with us. Uh, but we've got a great uh, conversation in store for you guys tonight. Um, so I think you know the way we want to start this off is uh, basically just having each of us talk about the project uh, that we've all worked on, sort of a quick five minute, uh, lay the foundation, and tell you guys what we did. So um, we're gonna start with um, Monica, my co-founder of the Evergrey. Um, and if you aren't familiar with the Evergrey, um, we are a local news organization. We publish a daily email newsletter that tells people what's going on in Seattle, how to feel more connected to the city and with each other. Um, and uh, I'll say a little bit about myself. I'll give a bio about Monica, and then she'll tell you a bit about our project. So um, previously, I worked as the engagement editor for the Seattle Times Education Lab project, and before that, worked for an education news startup. Um, I grew up in eastern North Carolina, and I moved to Seattle two years ago. Uh, Monica Guzman is my co-founder and editor of The Evergrey. She was a 2016 Neiman Fellow at Harvard University and was previously a technology and culture columnist for the Seattle Times and GeekWire. Um, she was born in Monterey, Mexico, and has lived in Seattle for 10 years. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Monica, and she's gonna tell you about a project that we did. So as Annika mentioned, we're a daily email newsletter, and the day after the election was quite the day to be writing a morning newsletter. Um, the reaction uh, in the couple of weeks after the election from Seattle was intense, as you all remember. And the way that we do what we do, we try to be really close to people, really close to what people are feeling and the mood of the city. So it was a really intense time for us. Among the many reactions that we heard from our audience, people emailed us and said, you know what, I'm actually, I'm curious. This is a blue city. I happen to be liberal myself, and I want to know more about the other side of this politically. I know there's a lot of anger, there's a lot of frustration, but I have a lot of curiosity. So Annika and I were wondering, how do we, how do we do that? How do we help people connect? And we really didn't know. And then one day, I think it was December, we saw that uh, a Washington Post columnist had created this really cool interactive map. And the map, if you plugged in the county that you lived in, somewhere in the United States, would tell you the nearest county to yours geographically that voted exactly opposite of yours in the presidential election. We plug in King County and the answer is Sherman County, Oregon, which is a county of about 2,000 people, uh, really close to the border with Washington, sort of in the eastern part of the state. So we decided to just throw it into the newsletter. Hey, everyone, here's this interactive map. Here's what it showed us. Anyone up for a road trip? This was totally on a whim. And a lot of people were. We got more than 20 responses, I think just in that day, of people going, actually, yeah, let's really, yeah, let's do it. So then for us, it was a choice of, okay, do we try to make this happen? <laughs> we have no idea how. Or do we just sort of sit back and say, well, that was interesting. Thank you all for your answers, and let's move on. Um, so we decided to, to go ahead and try. And it started with some Googling and landing on the Sherman County website, um, continued to thinking about who do we want to connect to? Would, would, would county politicians help us or what? But long story short, we ended up connecting to a woman who has written a kind of newsletter for Sherman County for many, many years. She connected us to a man named Sandy McNabb, uh, who worked with the uh, extension office uh, in the area. And what followed were lots of phone conversations to plan the logistics of that. So that happened on March 4th, uh, 2017. We took 19 people from King County on a five-hour road trip, five hours there, five hours back, um, and had a total of, what, three and a half hours of really interesting conversations. Uh, on that side, in Sherman County, our co-planner, Sandy, um, picked up the phone, made some calls, talked to people, and said, hey, come out and do this with us, and was really bought into the idea, planned it along with us. We had structured conversations. We had a meal together before all of that started. And then we led people through these exercises, one-on-one, -on -one, someone from King County, someone from Sherman County, talking about their concerns for the next few years politically. Um, we learned a lot through the planning of this event, and we were pretty anxious leading up to the event. Would it, will, will this work? Will people 
have spent 10 hours in a bus for nothing? And what about the people in Sherman County? Will they feel respected and heard? Or will this be like a strange urban caravan just coming into their <laughs> county? And we really, really wanted to. There were a lot of potential pitfalls. And um, the feedback we got was very encouraging. Um, among the, the negative things or the criticisms were we didn't do this for long enough. We didn't have enough time. I wanted to learn more. From Sherman County, we heard from wheat farmers who said, I don't feel like the cities understand my life. I don't feel like people in cities understand my life, even though I understand their lives. And that doesn't seem fair, and I didn't get enough of a chance to do that. But just about everyone agreed that it was a good first step, and that's what we were aiming for. So we're hoping to continue this, uh, and we have some ideas for how to do that. Awesome, thank you. Um, so next we have Bo Zhang. Um, she is a, um, oh, sorry. Next is Kelly and Heidi. So, um, so next we have Kelly and Heidi. Bo, you'll be up next. Um, so uh, Heidi Pitak, um, uh, she is the co-founder of the Heart Perception Project, uh, along with Kelly. Um, she is a communication trainer in Nashville who writes, speaks, and encourages others toward life-giving expression for deeper connection. She holds a PhD in communication, teaching courses at Williamson College, and serving as senior creative for Hippo Solutions. Um, Kelly Newton received her bachelor's in international studies from the UW um, and then went on to have a 20-year career as a massage therapist. She's now in the midst of a certification training in core energetics at the Seattle School of Body Psychology. And uh, she's the, also a co-founder of the Heart Perception Project and she finds inspiration from the nonviolent communication and restorative justice models of conflict resolution. So please uh, tell us about the Heart Perception Project. I'm Kelly, so I'm the liberal one of the two of us. I identify as a liberal non-theist. And um, this is my fr friend Heidi, that she's going to introduce herself, but she's the Christian evangelical conservative. From Nashville. And, from Nashville. <laughs> and like Monica said, the day after the election here in Seattle was uh, horrible. And I was one of the many people adding to the agitation on social media, I was a mess and s said some regrettable things. And, uh, and I came across, and my friendship with Heidi started in junior high, and we were really good friends then, but as life had it, sh we separated and she, became, she moved to the South and became more of a, a conservative Christian. I went to Seattle and became a liberal non-theist, as you do when you go to the <laughs> University of Washington. And, uh, <clears throat> So our friendship had been limited, and uh, uncharacteristically, I noticed a post. I mean, it was an uncharacteristic post for Heidi because she never posted anything political. And uh, <laughs> do you want to take it from there? Sure. So the day after the election, I woke up, and I started reading what people were posting on Facebook about people like me who had voted for Trump saying that we're all haters and racists and bigots. And I thought, oh my goodness, what? I am so not that. I am a lover. And it is because of all the things I love that I voted for the Republican Party. Now, I promise you, my vote wasn't for necessarily the character or communication skills of Trump. Um, cause I, cause there are many things that I do not resonate with as far as his style of leadership, but it was a vote for the Republican party and the things that I value that the Republican party stands for. So for me, it was a vote for all the things that I love. So I wrote a blog post and was very nervous when I hit publish because I knew that I have friends in my life like Kelly who are going to read that and very possibly might block me or unfriend me or never talk to me again. So I, uh, I put it out there and Kelly responded on Facebook to me. The title of her bl blog post was I Am Not a Hater, which created a little cognitive, cognitive dissonance in my brain because I had been indulging in the narrative all day that if you had inv voted for Trump, you were a hater and a racist and a bigot and stupid, <laughs> PhD in communications. Mm -hmm. um, so, I, and I, what, even though we had not been close for many years, I knew indeed she was a lover and so that she was a lovely person. And so it gave me pause. And because I took pause and because we engaged in dialogue with each other, 
we both realized we had a shared passion for bringing people together and we had both individually noticed that the rhetoric present in the entire run up to the election was one that reflected a very divided nation. And so I proposed the idea and she said yes of why don't we figure out how we can help people talk and connect from the level of the heart. But we knew that in order to do that, we first had to start doing that ourselves. So we embarked on a YouTube documentation of conversations that we had weekly. And I scheduled a flight to Nashville. I went there over inaugural weekend to hang out with her and her community. She's brave. <laughs> <laughs> I was the lone liberal non-theist at a table of 12 conservative Christians all having dinner and talking together. And it was rich and it was hard. And uh, we spoke to a high school there. We held a workshop there. And she and two of her friends, so the movement grows, just came this weekend. This is the end of the weekend. And we spoke to a high school here. We held a workshop. She sat down to eat with my very liberal friends and went to an Easter party with my other very liberal friends. And it has just been an amazing experience, so. It has been amazing, and I feel so welcomed here. And I, it, I, it has been eye-opening for me to hear people's stories, because we're both so, we, we are all so, um, Mode or persuaded by the media that is spinning rhetoric about either side. And it is until we can get face to face and have curious conversations that we're able to find connection. And I believe that is the hope for our divided nation. Awesome, thanks, thank you guys. Okay, and finally, we have Bo Zhang. Um, Bo is a former affordable housing developer and co-founder of the Bramble Project, um, which investigates the culture of responsible real estate development. Um, she's lived in Seattle for the last 10 years, and she was first introduced to the generative power of dialogue while participating in tough conversations on urban development in our city. And she created the Between Americans Project after the election. Hi. So Between Americans actually started uh, as a memorial to the grief and the shock that I and my fellow Hillary voters felt on the evening of election night. It had nothing to do with talking to the other side. And the only reason I got to where it was, where it is now, is that I took the idea to my boyfriend. I basically was going to capture all the raw emotions from social media and kind of put them on a shelf, and then bring out a public art installation of some sort that incorporated these emotions maybe a year after the election, just to kind of prolong our misery. <laughs> and because sadness is really important, right? Sad feelings, I'm a big fan of them. And, um, and my boyfriend was like, you know, no offense, but that's a really unoriginal idea. <laughs> and, <laughs> I was like, I can make it more interesting. So uh, what I then thought was, well, how about if instead of it being a snapshot in time, it were actually a story? And that's how it became what it is now, which is the story of a year of conversations between a dozen Hillary voters and a dozen Trump voters. Uh, and they live around the country. So and most of them haven't, don't know them from before the project started. So it's happening online in this private online forum. Uh, so the public can't see anything about what's going on or what people are talking about right now. On the anniversary of election night, we'll then share the story with the public in the form of kind of artistic interpretations of how the year went for people. So we'll have a public uh, installation at Westlake Park on the night of November 8th, and there will also be a web-based component. So you can go to betweenamericans.org, if you want to just sign up for the mailing list and be reminded closer to our launch. Awesome. Thank you guys so much again for, for all being here tonight. Um, I also meant to say this earlier. Uh, you know, just kind of want to 
put this out there. I hope that everybody tonight can be really respectful um, and, and thoughtful and curious in the questions that you ask in just a little bit. Um, you know, especially we are, we are so, so grateful to Heidi for coming out here um, in a city, you know, where the, the majority did not vote for Donald Trump. We just really appreciate you being here and being open and willing to, to share your thoughts and feelings on this stage. So really um, hope that we all can honor that here tonight. Um, and actually, I want to start the first question with you, Heidi. So after the election, you published a blog post um, and where you wrote that wise communication and the future of our great nation calls us as American citizens to believe the best about each other and to lace our speech with kindness and grace no matter who sits in the Oval Office, um, which I thought was a really nice sentiment. Um, so, you know, some people here tonight may may be wanting to hear from us about how to talk with those people who intensely you know, disagree with their own ideologies. And, and some people may still be asking themselves why. You know, why? Why should we talk with those who we intensely agree with? What is the advantage of this? Why even bother? And so I would love to hear your thoughts on that. Sure, so two reasons. One is because our collective experience in our country depends on it. I highly value peace and harmony. I think you all do too. I highly value that and want that for my family. I want it for my neighborhood. I want it for my town. I want it for my city. And so much of that experience of harmony happens when we're able to ask curious questions, to listen respectfully to the other side, find ways to share our own story and our own hearts in a way that draws people in and doesn't shut them out. So it's the big reason is because of the collective experience of our country. The second reason is because internally for me and I believe for all of us that it's not good for our bodies and our minds and our hearts to carry this animosity or this hatred or this, um, this boxing in and labeling of another side. It does damage to our minds. It definitely does damage to our bodies. We feel the stress of that. It comes out in so many ways. And it damages our hearts, too, because I believe one of our deepest needs is connection. And when we engage in the type of dialogue that we have seen that is so inciting in our country, then I believe that it is damaging to our hearts. But when we engage in thoughtful dialogue that creates those connections, it meets a deep need for all of us to experience that in our own private lives, but then in our country as a whole. What about you guys? Any other reasons why? Why we should be even having these conversations? Why bother? Well, I personally see how the other tactics haven't been working. <laughs> So that's the biggest argument. This isn't directly related to the election, but there's a really interesting piece uh, in Bloomberg by Karen Weiss from end of last year. And it, it, the title is, I think, something like Delicate Dances with Conservationists to Save Wolves. And it's about a, a small story in Washington state about this incredible... Uh, animosity between the conservationists and the cattle ranchers uh, over the gray wolf population. And it's a microcosm for what's happening nationally. And what they, the state basically ended up paying for them to go to mediation to figure it out. And the mediation pretty much is the mechanism that we're talking about, which is get to know each other as people, realize the other side is an evil. And they actually came up with a compromise. But what, what and it gets interesting too, it's just, just read the whole article because then um, you know, there, there's fake news in there, there's same side conflict, it, it, basically, um, I guess the short of it is uh, a, some speculation came out about the cattle ranchers and, and then what you end up with is the fact that the people who end up, who had come to the compromise were the only ones who had dialogued with each other and everybody else was still ready to believe that the other side was evil and so mm -hmm. that's, it just made for a really unstable solution. Yeah, I, I would add to all the reasons that there's a kind of truth you get when you talk to another human being that you will not get from thought pieces and you will not get from statistics. 
It's about people's lived experiences, how they shape what they believe, how they shape who they are, and we need to access that. I really believe that. I'm not sure how we're going to even be a fully governable nation if we start to lose that, and, and I'm not saying that we are, but I do think that we are inundated in alternatives. One last comment about that is I just want to say that I applaud all of you, and I applaud you for being here. I applaud all of you for initiating these different projects. I applaud Kelly. She's the one that reached out to me. And for you all to be interested in the other side, to be interested in having these conversations, I think it takes a great deal of courage and open-heartedness. So thank you. Well, we appreciate that. And actually, it's a great segue um, to that moment, Kelly, that you decided to, to lean in, to engage, um, rather than just react, right? I mean, you, you saw Heidi's post on Facebook, and then you, you had options in front of you. You know, what, what am I going to do now? Um, and so I'm, I'm curious, um, what, what made you decide to lean in and engage and did you do it with the intention of, I'm gonna set her straight and change her mind, or you know, with, with some other intention? No, it's a good question. I feel like my response to her blog post was attempting to change her mind. I took each part and responded to it. And I even used Bible verses because I used to be a Christian. And you know, and I was like, oh, this is gonna be so good. <laughs> It didn't work. And Imagine that. No, I know, funny. We can't change people. It's really hard. Uh, so I, 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 this is a good question because I'm still asking myself, because I'm so curious about this now that I'm aware of, like, there, there are protesters, and we need protesters, and there are bridge builders, and what creates that? Like, what creates a lean? And maybe it's just innate personality. I don't know. Like, I arranged the Hobby Lobby protest a couple of years ago when they opened up in North Seattle, and it exhausted me being like protesting all day and I just and there were Hobby Lobby supporters and I ended up being the only like Hobby Lobby protester that was going over to the supporters and like talking to them like they're humans and ended up like having a great conversation with an older man who ended up who was a friend of Scalia's and I told him my story like I have a very good reason why I needed access to the birth control that they were denying their employees because I have a genetically rare daughter who required $1.2 million in taxpayer-funded care. And it would be very irresponsible for me to reproduce again. And I did genetic testing. They just didn't test for the one that she had. And um, it was in that conversation where I listened to him and then he listened to me that I knew I did the best work that day because after that conversation, he said, wow, I really get why someone would need access to those birth controls. And, and that sort of created the bug. And so in this day after, while well, I was agitating and just being terrible and being a protester, I, I just, I sank into what I know works best for me, which is just connecting. And that's, I don't know what creates that urge, but I know for me, that is the only thing that really works. What about for you, Bo, and, and Monica as well? I'm, I'm curious what what sort of, I mean, Monica, obviously I'm more familiar with you. We <laughs> spend most of our waking hours together, but yep. um, <laughs> but but for both of you guys, what, what sort of made you lean in? And, and Bo, I know especially your project has sort of morphed over time as well. Uh, for me, it was definitely a curiosity, but I do have a story of um, something from before I actually started leaning in. Well, I guess this is my first moment of leaning in. Um, so after the election, I saw that the UW College Republicans had endorsed Trump after he won the primary, and so I decided that I wanted to go and meet some of these Republicans. And it hadn't occurred to me, I, I was just like, hey, you know, let's go meet some, does anybody want to go with me? And none of my friends wanted to go with me, so I was like, all right, I'll go on my own. It hadn't occurred to me <coughs> and how much I had viscerally embodied the fear 
of the news that I had consumed until I was about to head over to the meeting and I realized I was shaking in my boots scared. And I'm like, I think of myself as a very rational person. I'm like, these are college kids. Like there is <laughs> no reason to be scared. Um, but but I, I mean, I basically ate an entire bar of chocolate just so I could get myself <laughs> in that room. The great de-stressor. <laughs> Can I add one thing? I just want to make it clear, like, I really value protesting. Like, I didn't mean to make it sound like that is not valuable, but we need it all. We need protesters and people who really are passionate about that, and we need bridge, bridge builders. We need it all. So I just felt like I needed to clarify that. So I've been reflecting quite a bit on what makes me lean in, and, um, and it's my parents in a big way. So... Mm, I was born in Mexico. My parents are Mexican immigrants. And they voted for Trump. And when I bring this up in conversations in Seattle, it's an immediate conversation stopper. They, what? <laughs> huh? Like, meh, meh, makes no sense. Um, and it's, it's so interesting because, I mean, I see my parents every weekend. We have a great relationship. And we've been able to have really fascinating conversations about all of this. They've gotten really tense at times, but I don't know, we just find a way to work through the discomfort because frankly, there's a lot of love there and nothing is gonna bring that down. Um, and I, I'm a journalist, I enjoy asking questions. I would rather sit in that space because I learn so much more. Um, I was thinking earlier today that, you know, one of the big reactions after the election was disbelief but disbelief is just another form of curiosity. It's curiosity with a bit of irritation. It's sort of laced with irritation, <laughs> right? But, but you can choose where to go from there. <laughs> um, and you can choose to be curious. Uh, and so I have, I, I understand like really well why my mom voted for Trump, you know, being a woman of color and Mexican immigrant. And I understand why my dad voted for Trump too. And, they make, those re the reasons make a lot of sense to me. And so that's sort of the seed for me. Like, oh yeah, there's this nuance to our politics that has been um, overshadowed by much more sexy polarization. Um, and uh, Heidi, you were saying earlier today, we have a, you know, this human need for connection and, and we also have a human need for self-affirmation. And the election was a big test for a lot of people and um, you know, when, when you're afraid you might be wrong, you get defensive and you, you, you put your roots down and it's harder to listen to other people and, oh man, right? Like it's just getting worse and worse. I'm not sure what the end game is there. Um, but all I know is, you know, it, I, I know that the caricatures on all sides are completely wrong. They're wrong. So it's then a choice of everyone in society. Do we continue to accept the caricatures or do we go and look for the truth? Right, and I, and I think that um, it, it's a good point because I think something we, uh, many of us I think are still struggling with is what happens then um, when the dialogue coming from the other side, you know, is just, um, and this could be from either side, right, is just objectively hateful um, or, or traumatizing in some way, right, and, and I think um, there have been many times when I've had conversations with with friends, and you know they've they've said, "Why would I talk to somebody um, who challenges my very existence?" And I don't have a, a good answer for that, frankly. I, I'm I'm still very much struggling um, with that answer, which is why I'm now going to pass it on to Yubo. Um, <laughs> so um, you know, in that moment when when that that uh, objectful hatefulness may be happening. What is, you know, what, how does the recipient respond to that? Um, should they press forward? Should they disengage? Um, and, and I don't even mean to use the word should because this is a personal decision for, for everybody in that moment. Um, even when we talked about, you know, our Sherman County trip and building connections and building bridges, we were very conscious to say, this is not meant to be a judgment if you don't want to participate in this kind of conversation right now. It's, it's absolutely an individual choice. Um, but that being said, um, what are your, your thoughts on that, Bo? Um, 
you know, uh, I think that when you start talking about uh, shoulds and your political worldview, it, you kind of have to bring your own story into it. So, um, he, let me just explain a little bit about how I became really interested in the just the physics of conversation, and uh, it it's because when I was a kid, I actually was sort of on the receiving end of a lot of unintentionally um, but traumatizing rhetoric. Um, and so when I look, when I think about how other people might respond to hate, it, it, it brings me back to that place. And I'll say this, in the moment when you feel like you're being attacked, at least three things are being threatened simultaneously. There's your serenity, there's your dignity, and there's your faith in humanity, right? And I think where it gets confusing, I think the reason that we have so much confusion about how best to respond is that you can, in a, in, in a given moment, you can pick one of those things to recover first. And your response is really different depending on what that is. So for example, so I might choose to respond with air, which is non-confrontation just to maintain my serenity. I might choose to respond with rocks, which is standing up for myself and fighting for my dignity. And eventually, like after years and years of building up my reserves in those first two things, did I eventually get to water, which is dialogue. And dialogue, I mean, the beauty of dialogue, what I love about it, is that it has this sacred ability to bring somebody else, a former adversary, into your pool of understanding. Right, and you can actually co-create a new understanding of good because you can't be good in a vacuum, right? So good exists between two people. You co-create that in a way that actually can accommodate the both of you. And that's an incredible power and that's a very hopeful generative process. Mm -hmm. But I think it would be a mistake to say then the right response to every attack is dialogue because it's not meaningful without these other needs being met. Mm. And so I think sometimes when we see this infighting about, okay, how do we respond? It's that confusion. That I, I feel that confusion of you have all these needs that need to be met at the same time. And so I think the answer is that you do what feels right for you, right? And I think the best that we can do is, collectively is to maybe encourage each other to be thoughtful about the outcome that we want, um, to also push each other not to be habitualized or normalized to one specific pattern of response, yes. but then beyond that also just re be, really hold a space for each other to respond in the way that they feel called to do and trust that in the aggregate we'll be able to shift the needle forward. That's a really thoughtful response. <laughs> Really great response. Thank you, Bo, for that. Um, so I, I definitely want to leave enough time for questions, even though I have a bunch more. Um, I do also want to say that we are not the only people doing projects like this. Um, we, you know, there's our URLs there where you can learn more about um, each of the projects and, and check out the work that we've done. And then um, as the Evergrey, we've actually been creating a, a living uh, resources list of projects we're finding in Seattle and around the country that are trying to do this kind of bridge building. So um, that's bit.ly dot, uh, so B-I-T dot L-Y slash bridging divides. And that's where you can check out that list. Um, at the end of tonight, we're actually going to ask you know, anyone in the audience who's also working on similar projects to what uh, you know, we've been talking about, we would love for you to come up to the mic and just you know, give a one minute pitch of what you're doing. And then we'd love to add you to that list as well. Um, so with that, I would like to open it up to questions. And um, would ask that if you can please keep these as questions. Um, just after we're done with questions, we are, are going to ask you guys to just turn and talk to your neighbor. Um, we have a, a prompt to ask you, and then after that, you know, would love to invite you up to share comments and also, you know, any projects that you're working on. So let's start with, with the first question. Um, hello, um, my name is Mark Early, and I do appreciate all of you being here. Um, my question, I'd like to ask if you would respond to an observation I've had. I'll just be very brief with my observation. Um, I've attended probably 100 meetings of my local 
monthly meetings of my district Democrats. Uh, and I've always bought into the propaganda that we were, because we, were, we thought of ourselves as liberal and open-minded, that we were probably the most likely, between the two polar groups, political groups, we were the most likely to be open-minded open enough to listen to people who disagree with us. But my, I have to admit that my own experience is very, very different. I think generally liberals like myself, we become so, so much involved with the idea that our, our causes are just and right, and we're so commutarian. We believe that everybody should work together towards these common goals, and, and so it, it, tends to, it tends to make it difficult for us to accept that people actually share our goals, they disagree about the methods, how it's practical to get to those common goals. And I, what's been eye-opening is to read a book um, by Dana Lash. Sorry, I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask so, you, sorry, to get to the question. So, in that, that que so the question is, how, given that we do, um, it, do, would you say that probably the goals are what we really do mostly hold in common, that we disagree on the methods and what's the best way for us to try and um, learn from that and start talking about uh, the way, the, the, the things that we really do as goals share? What, what ways can we find to do that? And do you think that liberals, more than conservatives, I think, are more, liberals are actually, it makes it it's harder for us uh, to be able to accept that. You may disagree, but uh, that's my observation. Who wants to take that? <laughs> well, just I'll just answer the last part of that question. Um, I have some other thoughts, but I'd be interested in other people jumping in. Um, just I did actually just have a conservative friend post um, a, a stat to me yesterday that uh, liberals are three times as likely to unfriend yeah, their conservative friends on Facebook than the other way around. I once I decided to start dialoguing, I was struck by in the effort to prove how intolerant and hateful the right is. My progressive friends who were pointing that out were being extremely intolerant and hateful. So, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I don't have much else to say. I think you said it all. That's great. Next question. Um, I'm incredibly impressed by all of you and um, very moved. The cynic in me says, okay, this is great. Who can object to kumbaya? Nobody can object to people sitting, this chair, this chair, this person talks, this person talks, you go into an advanced listening mode and you have heart chakra opening. And then those people go back, they vote for what they vote for, nothing's changed. So what really interests me is the tipping point. When in a conversation, I love specifics, real conversations, my best friend, is a Republican. I only found out eight years ago that she was inspired by me to vote. She was originally not going to vote. And I went, wow. And she said, I voted for McCain and Palin. <laughs> and that started an eight-year process of really incredible conversations. A lot of it got down to where do you get your news? Probably three quarters of our agreement came from collaborating on where we got our news and finding out real truths. There's other areas where people have different belief systems that don't change. So I love real stories about, was there a tipping point or did you both go back in your bus, you still believe exactly what you believed before and there's no change? And if so, what's the point? So we should all believe the same things. <laughs> I mean, I, I say that in jest, but I, I mean, um, the goal for us was never to convert people down in Sherman County, never. That was never our intention. Um, it, it was just about having that curiosity, and and people have asked us, you know, what's the end game there? You know, why? Um, and I, you know, I think it's just that without that curiosity, why do anything? Where where is any progress whatsoever? Um, by having debates with people we disagree with, we sharpen our 
all the ideas, I believe. Um, and I know I'm young, I'm a millennial, you know, you can say I'm naive and, and kumbaya, but um, I just don't see how there's any progress on anything without approaching conversations with curiosity and empathy, so. Yeah, when I, when I have conversations with, with my mom in particular, um, I'm happy that we're both people who can say the following very important phrase, which is, I never thought of it that way. So I think in dialogue, you end up learning a lot more about what you think your beliefs are and what you think they're founded on when you come to understand what someone else's beliefs are and what they are founded on. So what I've found is that in a lot of cases where I was certain, I'm no longer that certain. And so it's, it's what you were saying about that space of good um, that you kind of co-create between you. But there are places where it is really difficult. Um, you know, some of the sources my mom thinks are credible, I really don't. And, and I point that out, and then she says, well, you know, what about that time that the AP did that, and the New York Times did that? And I go, you know, you're right. I can, see, I can actually see what you mean there. I, I really see that. So it's just usually not as black as white and white as I came in thinking it was. So it's difficult to seek that end game as you go through the dialogue. Um, so you asked for a specific story, and, and I only have a specific story that's vocal, so I wanna put that to the side because I wanna piggyback off of what Monica said. Um, part of what's been so great about our communication being democratized is that all these voices that had never been heard before have surfaced, and we and kind of the scales fell from our eyes. You know, it's not all been bad, right? This democratized media, like we now see how much there is left to do, right? And so now our to-do list is really, 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 really long. And you know, so earlier I talked about this. I think we're talking a lot about sort of fighting versus talking, but you know, when I was doing the dignity and dialogue, there's that third leg of the stool, which is serenity. And it's, it's not a popular choice right now, uh, the acceptance part of it, um, because we are being so awakened by just how much there is to do. But some of these ideals, I mean, like the idea of justice, right? Of, Fairness. I mean, these are, in a way, sometimes just pots of gold at the end of the rainbow, and, and you can spend a lifetime navigating to it, but it's a shifting target, and you can end your life not feeling like you got much closer than where you started, because you're just uncovering more and more things. And so I feel like there is that certain level of acceptance of that truth, that you're not going to get everything that you want. And, um, and I think part of dialogue is creating that strategy and figuring out, okay, of this long list of things that should be, what really could be right now? And what can I stomach deferring for maybe later when it's a little bit more possible? I would say this, that the change may never happen that we want to see in policy, but where the change happens is in our relationships. I've heard more stories of sisters who won't talk to each other, of families that are so divided, of neighbors that can't even look at each other. And I have a friendship here with my friend Kelly. We've been friends for 30 years. And right in November was a crossroads and we had to make a decision. Was policy going to be more important than our relationship or was our relationship going to be more important than policy. And we made the choice for our relationship. And I'm so thankful because it could have gone a different way. And I would just add to that too, what's the point if we don't change anyone? What's the end game of not talking to people? I mean, like on the grand scale, like what are we seeing in our nation? We have cities that are no longer equally mixed on right and left. It used to be every major city was equally mixed. Now we have liberal cities, we have red cities because nobody's talking to each other. So what is the end game? We're talking about civil war. I mean, this is what I hear. And that is really disturbing. So we don't have to change each other. We just have to remember that we're all humans and that we all want the same things. That's, that's what the point is, so. 
Thank you, guys. So just a quick note. Um, uh, Heidi is having to, she's going to have to head out in about 10 minutes to fly back to Tennessee. So if anyone has specific questions for her, um, hopefully you can get that in but before she has to head out. So I would give anyone who has specific questions for her priority. Oh, Either one of, yeah, I, I think this lady was in line first, then you're, you're welcome to go next. Sorry. Hi, I, I'm stealing actually a set of questions that I heard from Krista Tippett when she came and had a panel at the uh, Citizen University uh, conference a couple weeks ago. And, and the set of questions was, um, and for you, Kelly, and maybe Heidi, you can reciprocate, was um, what can you see from your point of view that might have some pitfalls or negatives? And what can you see from your friend's point of view that could have some positives and you know good outcomes? Yeah, thank you. That's, That's a great question. question. I see from our point of view that so often we create these black and white issues when they are so very nuanced. For Kelly and I, we had a conversation on the way back to the airport in Nashville about abortion. It was a very difficult conversation and very heartfelt on both of our sides. And at one point, um, Kelly was explaining to me how much she does value life. And I went, wow, because my side spins it that we are pro-life, we value life, and the other side is pro-choice, so they just value choice and not life. And then this conversation to hear Kelly say with tears in her eyes, oh no, I deeply value life. And I went, oh my goodness, what a, this is fantastic. We, we found some common ground on that. So I think that polarization that's created by the media, we're able to transcend that when we have a conversation and hear each other's hearts. Mm -hmm. And then what was, what do you find the pitfalls are on my side of the aisle? Because she wanted to hear what you see your pitfalls are and what ours are. Right. So m my pitfalls would be definitely making it the making it the black and white issues, mm -hmm. and I'm sure it's on the other side as well. And what I see of I don't I'm not going to speak to your pitfalls, but <laughs> I wanted to. But the, it's an interesting question, though. It's like what do we okay. perceive on the other yeah, side? Yeah. So the the yeah. <laughs> okay it's okay. okay. All right, I'll say it. Ah! You won't be lynched. I promise. So the pitfalls on your own side. Yeah, it was and she right? said black and white on her side. So what do you perceive them to be on Pit her side? Pitfalls. Okay. So one big one for me is is that the the fact that I have a particular value system that motivates me to vote in a particular way, um, that I would, would be pegged a hater because of that is really hard because um, the fact that someone feels right about something and maybe believes something else is wrong doesn't mean that they hate the person. It means that they're standing on a particular issue. And so to label all to label all conservatives like me as haters, um, that's, it's, that's very, very hard to stomach. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that question. Who's next? Go, yeah, just you okay. can go ahead. Go, all right, yeah. um, okay, so I, I might have a question that's specific to you guys, especially with the Facebook conversation you guys had, your blog post and whatnot. Um, I have a, a somewhat unique, not incredibly unique experience of, I'm originally from Northwest Indiana, and so I moved here about like five years ago. And so I've gotten, I grew up in a very rural area, but with like Chicago nearby as like a bigger city, and now that I'm living in a bigger city. Um, what I'm curious uh, about your perspectives is um, you're encouraging conversation, which I totally agree with, and I appreciate the value of having conversations. But for me, I've got a big connection to a lot of people back home that are conservative, is, I mean, like, is, are you, am I going to get an effective conversation out of Facebook or you know, people that can't go to Oregon? You know, what is the best way for us to communicate? Because I, it seems like face-to-face -face is where you guys have had the most success, of course. But when you can't go to another state or when you are in a bubble of where you live, how should people approach uh, having conversations with people that they disagree with and not go crazy and end up defriending each other on Facebook? <laughs> well, we did... A, every week we had Zoom calls with each other. Okay. 
So we were looking in each other's eyes and having direct contact. Now, it's not the same as in person, but man, technology makes it almost as good. And just so a quick note, I, Zoom is a video chat tool for those who, who don't know. Oh, right. It's a, yeah, it's like Skype, but you can record yourself easily. So um, that would be great. And, and that... But that takes a risk. I mean, Facebook is so easy. It's like pseudo relationship. Mm -hmm. And you actually, when you say commit to like, let's have a video chat because I really want to have contact with you, like that takes investment. And you have to really gauge, is that is that what you want? Mm -hmm. And I would hope the answer is yes, but it also bumps us up against, oh, I'm actually quite resistant because I may have to change, mm -hmm. you know. I would also suggest if you're going to use something like Facebook Messenger where you can have a conversation in writing that you set some parameters beforehand and just say, I would love to have a curious conversation with you uh, where we just ask each other curious questions and maybe try to define what's a curious question and what's a loaded question. <laughs> <laughs> and if you can establish that parameter beforehand, then you may be able to actually share it with each other. So working in media, you know, Anika and I do just about everything digitally with email and Slack and a bunch of things. What was so fascinating about planning our trip to Sherman County was, I mean, there must have been at least 10 hours on the phone with Sandy um, down in Oregon, and it had to be the phone, and we knew it had to be the phone because there would be moments where an idea was posed, and just in the pause, you heard resistance. You heard someone not quite knowing how to articulate why that bothers him. And we uncovered all these biases in our questions that we didn't know were there and the way we were structuring the event. We ran into all these fascinating divisions in the way that we looked at how we were gonna do this um, in a way that respected both sides. And there's, I just, think of everything you don't have on Facebook. You don't have reaction. Like, I, as I talk, if y'all start to laugh or go, oh, you know, I will edit live what I am saying, right? But on Facebook, no one has any idea halfway down that they are not making sense to their audience, that they are putting forth a really mixed meaning. There's no gestures, there's no response, there's no feedback, there's nothing. It's a terrible way to communicate. Let's be honest about that. It's a really bad way to communicate. So, I mean, is it better than nothing? Sure. Is it good for a lot of things? Yes. Is it good for this moment? I don't know. I don't, I don't know. Totally agree with that. So um, please thank me again for having Heidi here. She has to head out now. We're so grateful that you joined us. So thank you. Thank you again and safe travels home. Um, we, are, we actually you know, talked before. Uh, tonight's event about doing a debrief with the five of us on Zoom, which is a video chat. Um, so, you know, hopefully we can we can hear from Heidi after that, and um, we'll post that to the Evergrey and Heart Perception Project, and maybe Between Americans as well. And you guys can check that out. So, um, we'll take more questions. Yeah. Go ahead. So, um, I'm wondering what y'all think of uh, identity politics. I think that's one of the things that um, really uh, increased the divide is the sense of. Um, even in your question, um, like, oh, this is actually, f the other side is threatening my way of life or who I identify as. Um, what, is there a way to, to maybe nuance or maybe create like a sense of um, just increased understanding? I, I, I'm having trouble like navigating where all the areas where I hold privilege and, you know, places where I don't and trying to be like a more conscious person, but it feels overwhelming, so. a really hard question. Yeah. Monica just told me to take it and I just sort of shook well, my head. Here's something that became very clear is always check out what you mean by a term. So identity politics has been thrown around. I'm still not quite sure what it means. So what does it mean to you? And then I'll better know how to respond to your question. Uh, I don't quite understand it either. I think I see it. I, so how I see, do we well, know what to talk I, about? <laughs> I see it much more on the right, right? This idea that, you know, I think we're trying to operate on like multiple, like whether it be like gender or race or, you know, like LGBTQ. Um, I think there's a lot of um, nuance that I think liberals are trying to bring to the conversation that maybe, maybe conservatives are not ready to engage in given their context. Um, I'm having trouble kind of like navigating what, f uh, yeah, I mean, in Seattle it's hard to, 
I, I don't know. I, I, to I, I, I totally hear you. I mean, yeah. all that, yes. I relate with so yes. much of that. Yes. I, one story I will share um, is that I, I never thought of myself as a person of color until I moved to Seattle. Um, and there's a lot to talk about there, but um, <laughs> after the election, you know, yeah, I, I had a really hard time for a few weeks, and um, uh, a friend of mine, you know, who's a, a, a white male, um, you know, was also having a really hard time, and, and he came over, and we were talking about it, and he was like, man, but you must be really having a hard time. You know, you're a, you're a female person of color, and he didn't mean it in any sort of, you know, like in, in any sort of negative way, but you know, there's a lot of assumptions there, right? Um, but I have certain privileges, and um, they're all different, weight, weight in different ways, and um, it's a hard thing to sort of suss out. But I think my, from what I understand about the term that people, about the term of identity politics, um, my, my uh, hesitation slash frustration with it is that it, it's loaded with a lot of assumptions. Um, and we all identify in different ways uh, that are not immediately apparent by the way we look. So um, that's my, my two cents on that. Yeah, I think it's tough. Um, I share that same experience of suddenly being lumped into person of color. Um, in a way, it's sort of, some of, sometimes just to have the language, a common language to talk about these things, we end up um, making people less unique than they actually are. And I remember having some jarring experiences after the election where um, I was in circles talking about what to do, you know, how do we resist the Trump administration? And, and very well-meaning people were basically kind of, um, I guess it's, I, I just sort of have to provide the exchange, but essentially, you know, like if I started talking at the same time that a white person was talking, I mean, I love to talk, so I'm like, please, you talk. And um, and they were like, no, 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 I'm gonna take my white privilege back and give you the floor. And it was so well-meaning, you know? And it was so, like, um, but it was, it, that suddenly made me conscious that I, oh, <laughs> I forgot about this, you know? Um, <laughs> and so um, it's hard. And I, and I don't know if, if maybe we just need to be better at giving each other positive feedback so it's not always like, oh, you did that wrong, you know? Um, I, I don't have an answer. <laughs> it's it's just dialogue, you know. You just keep on talking, and hopefully, eventually, you know, we we aggregate and we figure out these things that we need to do, and then we are able to get back to being our individual selves with this new awareness that we have. So I think we've got time for a couple more questions. Um, so go ahead. Hi, all thanks for being here. Um, I I think we can all agree that uh, unity is better than disunity. Leaning into complexity is better than thinking in black and white, um, that this kumbaya sense in the cynics in the cynics mode is, is is the right and good thing. But I'm curious how you think about how this might translate into the arena of policy making. And uh, I think Heidi mentioned that yeah, friendship and sustaining human connection is more important than policy, but as we all know, policy isn't neutral either. So what I wanted to ask you and Heidi was, you know, were there sacrifices on certain policy stances that you had to make in order to maintain that relationship? Are there certain things that you'll vote for that you wouldn't have voted before <laughs> having these intense, reflective, wide-ranging conversations with your political opponent, who also happens to be your friend? <laughs> I think that still begs the question of intent. Like, is the intent of this to change them? Yeah. And the intent, at least for us, is to get to know the other side better. Uh, I don't expect her to change her vote. She doesn't expect me to change her vote. What I expect is for her to not make assumptions about myself and the people I hold dear and vice versa. I will now, I now do not have the same reaction I did to evangelical Christians, okay? Visceral reaction, I don't have that anymore. She, uh, Friday night at the dinner table, there was a gay couple, a married couple that had been together for 22 years, only could just get married recently. There was my friend who was the mother of a transgender daughter. There were my friends, radical environmentalists who are vegans and they don't fly much because they 
don't want to have a big carbon footprint. So these are not people in her world. And at the end, she said, I want you to know that what I'm taking away from here is that I know you and I have a connection to you. And now if I ever hear anyone saying something homophobic, I will stand up and say something. If I hear anyone saying something hateful about transgender people, I will stand up and say something. And what I hope from you is that if you hear anyone saying something hateful about Christians, that you will stand up and say something. And I can absolutely say yes to that. So it doesn't matter to me how she changes her vote. How much does DC really affect my life personally? Not much, you know? What affects my life directly are my relationships, so. Thank you. Thank you, so one, one more question. Oh, there's so many good questions. Uh, okay, go, uh, go, go ahead. Thank you. Um, I'd like to raise the issue that you're speaking about, which I consider really important for the country to a broader level. What would affect us from DC is war. And the things you're talking about apply just as much to our international view of things as they do to our relations with our close friends. I just came back from Birmingham, Alabama. I was protesting no war. This is before we bombed. And I was trying to practice the principles you're talking about. So, I got back here and I discovered our president had bombed and he became, according to some pundits, presidential. And there was almost universal support without knowing who did it and what happened across the country. I'm gonna have to ask you to ask a question. So I need to ask your opinion about expanding this princip the principles you're talking about to our thoughts and our relations to other countries because nuclear war is a real possibility. And when you say expanding it to, to other countries, just in terms of, of understanding cultural differences between the US and other Well, when I came back from Iraq, I said, don't demonize Saddam Hussein. That's the way you go to war. And we did. And so I would say, how do we teach these principles? Don't demonize <coughs> President Assad. Don't demonize the people that our country who want us to go to war. Do demonize, do hate to speak in the hateful language of war. I think that's a message for all of us because people in my community have been quite hateful in using language talking to about Assad or other people that were in danger of going to war with. Any thoughts on that, guys? I mean, to me, the, the same principles we're talking about here apply. Um, Everyone is a human being. Absolutely. If you, if you disregard that and consider people irredeemably evil, my friend was calling Assad a monster. Absolutely. And yeah. I said, that's the language of war. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for your question. Um, I think, so we're, I, just quickly, it's, can I make a huge difference? No. But a thousand of people like myself can. A thousand of people, you know, ten thousand people doing this, and it, it 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 does sound like and feel like shouting into the wind, but the more people can make connections and and see that this is a human being, the less we're going to kill each other. I don't I don't know what the answer is, but I this is the only thing I can do. What it's you're where my about heart is. Is the principles of nonviolence yes, in non your communication with each other? Absolutely. We as a country need to learn to practice that. Yeah, thank you for that. Thank you. So I think I, I know you were standing over there. I want you to get your question in. So come on up and then we'll and then we'll do a, a one last wrap up. Thank you so much. Um, I just wanted to ask you, um, Monica, I had the same kind of similar conversation with my parents where they like revealed to me stuff that I hadn't really thought about before. Um, and I was kind of recapping this conversation to one of my friends and we both go to UW and we kind of have this like liberal, like young person thing going on. Um, <laughs> and like kind of he was telling me like, oh, but they're like misregarding all these facts and like there are like these things that like I know and I just kind of wanted to ask like, how do you cultivate that like intent of curiosity and that attitude of respect um, that you need for these kinds of conversations? Like how do you set the stage? Well, 
in our conversations that we did in Sherman County, before we had people pair off into one-to-one -to, -one to talk about their concerns for the country, we had them ask each other about a favorite childhood memory. So for a minute each, someone from Sherman County you know, would, would tell the person from King County a favorite childhood memory and then it'd switch for a minute. And it, there's an intention there, and the intention is to see each other as human beings before we see each other as a collection of issues and opinions. Um, and I think that that does wonders. Um, so, I mean, I think why, why it works so well with me and my parents is there's love. Like, like I said, there's love. There's a, there's a real respect. It's not questioned, and it's a great foundation for, for a curious conversation. Um, so I think that's, that's the conditions. If you can't get to love in five minutes, mm -hmm. um, you know, is, is, there some, is there something else? And actually, we had a facilitator, Bob Staines, who gave us some great advice about how to set up Sherman County. And one of the points of advice he gave us was, as soon as you step off that bus, what can you do, right? Like, smiles on your faces, warmth in your, in your gestures. Um, Will people know where the food is? Will people see that handshake? You know, will it all kind of be ready to be warm and welcome and to set that tone? And that's an incredibly difficult thing to do, again, on Facebook. People just left a fight and now they're joining yours. That's, that's what that's like. People just saw an article that <coughs> made them really mad and now they're jumping into your comment thread. So giving the space for, for contextualizing the conversation as something that will be respectful is really, really important. Can I say quickly, because I love this question. We, in the polarization of our cities, in the fact that we don't walk amongst each other anymore, we don't have to practice deciding not to be reactive. It is a personal choice. Whether you use your reptilian brain and go into fight or flight and reaction, or whether your prefrontal cortex governs and you decide to slow down and listen and not let yourself get triggered. It's a choice. and. I, when I was in Nashville, I had to make that choice every minute. It was hard work. I was so exhausted when I came back, but I did it. And that's how you cultivate it. it you work. You use the muscle that we're not practicing using anymore. So. And yeah, and I was just gonna say we we had this conversation earlier that these conversations are work, right? And Monica, I think you put it really well earlier when you said, you know. We think of conversations as needing to be these easy things, right? You, and if a conversation feels like too much work with someone, then ugh, it doesn't feel right. It's not worth it. We move on. But actually, all of these conversations, I mean, every single interaction we had with folks at Sherman County, I was on for every single one. I was thinking of what I was doing, my body language, what I said, how I said it. And it just takes that work. And hopefully, over time, eventually, it becomes easier when you build a relationship with that person. But it does really have to be a conscious effort. Cool. Thank you. Um, so I think what uh, we would love for, for you guys to do is take about five minutes, turn to someone you're sitting near, sitting next to, and uh, maybe just talk about um, maybe the, the resistance or fear that you have of talking to someone um, who is on the other side of, of the divide, um, however you may consider that divide, or, or someone who you, know, you really may disagree with um, ideologically. Um, and then talk about maybe about a, a creative solution to moving past that fear. And we would love to hear some of your responses to that. Um, and also, you know, we mentioned hearing about any other projects that you all are working on. So if you wanted to just take five quick minutes to do that, and then we'd love to have you share out.
Here's your, your two minute warning. Here's a two minute warning. We'll ask you guys to come up in just two minutes. Okay, guys. Okay. That's five minutes. Um, we would love to... Thanks, guys. Thanks for wrapping up. Um, we would love to invite any folks uh, to the microphone, as I said, who are working on similar projects um, as we've done. See Ross there. Ross is going to have a great project to share with you guys. Um, and or uh, to share something you discussed. If you want to share something awesome that your partner suggested or share something that uh, you talked about, we would love to hear from you. Um, because I see a few people lining up, I'm going to ask that you please keep this to a minute or less, um, and this will be our, our wrap-up for the evening. I'm Ross Reynolds. I'm with KUOW. We're doing a project called... Thank you. Does that come out of my minute? <laughs> Uh, our project is basically along the lines of a lot of what we've heard, trying to create conversations where they might not happen. This began in December 2015 when our now president announced he wanted to keep Muslims out of the country. It occurred to me, how many of us actually know Muslims who we could talk to? And if we know them, we might work with them or we might uh, do something social with them. We might not feel comfortable about talking about politics. We created an event in February and then another one in July called Ask a Muslim. We took a, a Torah page out of speed dating and it was like you sit and you talk to a Muslim for six minutes, talk to another one for six minutes, and you went around the room afterwards. We had a group conversation which was very brief and then we had dinner and that's when the conversations really got going. So we've taken that idea and we're expanding it. We did another Ask a Muslim on April 2nd. We're going to do Ask a Trump supporter coming up on April 30th. I'm looking forward to that and when I think about all the advice we heard about how to have these conversations, I guess the one thing that I'm going to say to people when they come to this event is that don't think of these people as representing the group that they come from. They represent themselves, they're individuals, and you'll talk to 12 Trump supporters, but you're not going to know a lot about Trump supporters. You're going to know about some people, and it's going to help you out a lot. The extra added part of this project that I'm extremely excited about, now that we've had a chance to practice it a few times, is that we've got a, a sociologist who's doing some before and after surveys. We want to find out if this technique actually moves the needle when it comes to empathy and understanding. And then the capstone of the project, which might be of interest to those of you who go, what could I do with this, will be a toolkit, an ASCA toolkit, so that anyone can take this idea, learn from our mistakes, and create your own kind of interaction like this with any group you want to. Awesome. Thank you, Ross. That'll be a great event. We're excited for that. Yeah, go ahead. All right, um, I'll keep it brief. My name is Jamie. Uh, I got interested in this work. Um, I, last fall, I was uh, campaigning for Hillary on a bike trip across the country. Uh, we went through a lot of swing states and volunteered in her, for her campaign, but also just um, ended up meeting and actually staying with a lot of Trump supporters as well in the in-between areas. And that experience made me experience, uh, made me understand just how divided the different parts of our country are, because you're really moving through them um, on your bike very slowly. Um, <laughs> and then also had very positive conversations with uh, many of the people, not all the people, but many of the people I met. And it helped me actually um, be optimistic about, uh, about uh, where our country could go. And so when I came back here after the election, um, I wanted to have continue this in my own life, but also help facilitate this for other people. 
So I'm working on a project under the name Everyone at the Table. Um, I've been in touch with a few uh, Trump supporter, a couple of Trump supporters in uh, Enumclaw, because um, I was trying to keep it within King County. Um, and actually, ironically, I'm sort of in the stage of trying to find uh, more Trump supporters, but also liberals in Seattle who I don't know already. Um, so if anyone is interested in participating in this or collaborating, and I see there are some other people here who are doing projects, um, I would love to talk more. And um, I'll be in that back corner after the conversation um, if you guys would like to. Thanks. Awesome. Thanks, Jamie. And uh, we'll ask you, Jamie, actually, um, after if you want to come up and give us your email address as well, we'll add your details to our page, too. So you guys could go there for, to get in touch with him as well. Go ahead. All right. Um, so I'm with a group called the Transpartisan Alliance, and we've been trying to facilitate cross-partisan dialogues um, you know, for several, at least several years now. And we're looking into ways to kind of branch out, you know, the ways of facilitating these conversations, and you know, your ideas for, you know, having sit-down meals with people from the opposite side, kind of inspired us. And so right now we're trying to organize some potlucks. Right now, maybe just medium-sized group, no more than probably 10 people to start out with. Uh, we don't have anything really formal or organized set up yet, but if any of you are interested, you know, feel free to come by after the meeting and I'll try and get your information and try and get you all in the loop. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, Seattle's a small town. I was going to mention Transpartisan Alliance because I joined that group about eight years ago and I know it's reviving now and so I, I would encourage people to, to consider that. And I think they're reviving the web presence. Uh, the, uh, another group um, that started also probably about eight or ten years ago, and I think there's still um, some information about them online, is the Conversation Cafe, which used a number of techniques to facilitate conversations between uh, people who might not agree on, on a number of different things, and uh, they kind of established, a, I thought, a really interesting set of uh, procedures that were easy to follow. and and uh, it helped facilitate conversation. They use talking sticks and other things. So that's another, that's another group. It may be more historical, but I think a lot, some of their techniques are still available online. Great, thank you. Scott. I'm with Marlon, who just spoke. So he and I are working to get this group of five and five together to have a discussion. I'd just like to mention another group, which is national, called Campaign Nonviolence. Campaignnonviolence.org actually linked a three-minute video that I made about this issue um, on their website coming from Town Hall. It's called Address to the Nation, and anyone that wanted to could come and talk about that, so if you're interested. But the key thing is campaign nonviolence to give you the theoretical, critical background for these kind of discussions in all kind of contexts, whether it's international or family. Awesome. Thank you so much. We'll add that to our list. Hi, my name is Maddie, and I founded a group called What's Next, which provides spaces for people to become educated, empowered, um, and thoughtful advocates. And I have a good friend who I worked with actually pre-election. Um, he is a Republican, I as a Democrat, working together to abolish the death penalty. So I know that there's actionable ways in which you can work together with people you might disagree on on numerous issues, but if you can find that common ground on one issue. And so he has really graciously agreed to be essentially an open floor uh, next Tuesday for Ask a Republican. He's a former Republican delegate, has worked in Olympia. Um, so if you're interested in what's going on with the Republican Party in terms of Washington politics um, and uh, federally as well, they're going through their kind of own upheaval too with disagreements on their side. So he's just a great wealth of knowledge and a really good conversationalist. Um, so I'll be here if you want to talk to me more about it, but I'll also share the info as well. So if you're interested, next Tuesday we'll be doing Ask a Republican. Thank you. That's great. Hi, my name is Andrea Cohen, and I teach something called Compassionate Listening. I'm associated with the Compassionate Listening Project. We do workshops on helping people develop skills so that they can um, bridge the divide without exploding, whether that be within their families or within their communities. And our basic workshop is called Healing the World from the Inside Out. So what can we do? close to home, what are the skills we need in managing our triggers and um, staying in connection heart to heart. So um, 
I, th I guess check with Evergrey because we will list with them when we're doing a workshop and if any of you are really interested in something like that, can they contact you? Yes, yeah, okay. yeah. you can check out we, uh, yeah. our list and yeah, yeah we, we send a, a roundup of events every Monday in our newsletter and, and that's okay. where we listed Andrew's It last takes event. a lot of work and there are a lot of skills to be learned through this, so I'm happy to see all of you here. Thank you. Thank you. I think I want to hire her. Uh, my name is Barbara Dean, and I'm the co-director of the Institute for Sustainable Diversity and Inclusion, and we put on the Northwest Diversity Learning Series, which I co-founded 19 years ago. And this year, we decided to focus on the theme of uh, seizing the courage to have disruptive conversations. And we chose, uh, the series is made up of six bi-monthly workshops. And our premise is that um, employees are dealing with these issues and they come into the workplace, but it's hard to deal with and, and we felt that it would be helpful to try to build some skills around this. So we, we chose topics that very much came out of the election, um, sometimes uh, directly, sometimes indirectly. So our uh, session coming up in May is on uh, seizing the courage to deconstruct white male privilege. Um, and then we have several uh, more topics throughout the year. Um, we're, we're hoping, we're partnering with Fierce uh, Conversations, which is a group here in Seattle. Um, they have a certain technology around that, and so we're, we're using that technology to help people think about how they have uh, difficult conversations. And one of, the, um, one of the, the pillars of Fierce Conversations is maintaining the relationship. So I really appreciated those comments. Thank you. Thank you so much. And we, uh, we had one question from the audience while we were up here, and, and she asked, you know, what did you guys learn in Sherman County? Like, we're all dying to know. Um, we wrote about it, so check it out on the Evergrey. We also have someone who went on the trip with us, Mason. Um, so if you want to share a little bit about that, go for it. Yeah, I didn't think I was going to be the last word, so I hope I don't strike too cynical of a tone. But um, <laughs> I went down to Sherman County with the Evergrey because like most of you, I was sort of disheartened by the deep, deep division facing our country. My, my mom and her half-sister, my aunt, have not spoken since the election for political reasons. So it's, it's, it's a difficult thing for lots of people, some more than others, that's for sure. Let's not forget that. Um, and while I was heartened by some of the things I learned down there, for example, it was, it was illuminating to me to hear farmers talk about the way Obama-era policies have had concrete, concrete negative manifestations in their life and things I never heard about, things I didn't, I hadn't known were a thing. I'm glad I know that now, that's good. I, my horizon has been enlarged in that way. But I also realized that I wasn't very articulate at, um, at making my arguments about what I believe most deeply. And so I took the opportunity as an opportunity to, to sharpen the way I talk about the things and the way I believe in the things that I care most about. And so we, these conversations aren't gonna be all unicorns and butterflies, that's for sure. Um, but if nothing else, let's take the opportunity to, um, to better articulate what we believe, to sharpen our arguments, and, and to stand up for those things if we truly believe that it's being threatened. You could not have ended on a better note, Mason. Thank you. <laughs> totally agree with that. Thank you all for being here tonight. Um, as we said, check out our resource list. Uh, we will be adding more projects to it, and we just really appreciate your time, so thank you.